Hello and welcome to Bible Threads with Dr. Bruce Becker. Today we've got a special Bible Threads. I'm here today with Pastor Mike Novotny, the lead speaker and podcaster and author of Time of Grace Ministry. And we're going to be talking about a new book that he has written that's going to be published uh, this summer. Pastor Mike, it's called What's Big Starts Small. Can you tell us why you wrote why you wrote this? Yeah, good question. So, um, Bruce, you know, if anyone's out there ever done any kind of Christian videos or blog writing or just communicated with another person, uh, you're obviously trying to think, what, what do I have to offer? What does the Bible have to offer that's going to help a Christian solve a problem? So What's Big Start Small, which uh, drops here in June, is really about solving the problem that so, 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 so many Christians, that's my <laughs> official analytic, uh, <laughs> so many Christians forget this really simple thing that Jesus said all the time, that there's actually a thread through the whole Bible that it shows up. And the thing that Christians forget is this, that the word of God is like a seed. And I think if you slow down long enough and really think, think about what a seed is and how a seed works and how a seed grows or how a seed doesn't grow, how it dies, how it thrives. If you realize that the Bible that you hear on a podcast like this or in church on a Sunday, or as you're reading your Bible at home, that what's happening is that God is sowing a seed of biblical truth in your direction. If you could remember that, man, that, I, that would change the way that you approached church Christianity, and your faith. Something really big, or unfortunately, nothing at all, could come out of that little, little small seed that God sowed in your direction. Well, that's an interesting perspective on the relationship between a seed and uh, what we read about in the, in the Bible. You know, in the first uh, opening chapter, you write about great faith, and you just refer to that either really something great or something not so great. Can you describe what you mean by that? And how do I get great faith? Yeah. Yeah. So it's cool to think about if in the parable of the sower, and we're going to get there in just a little bit, you know, Jesus said this little seed that God sows can actually grow and become 30 or 60 or even a hundred times more what was sown. So that's a little bit where I stole the title of this book. You know, what's, what's really big, a hundred times what was sown started with just a single seed. Um, isn't that crazy to think about if you had never seen like how, where tomatoes came from, if you were like in a cave your whole life <laughs> and you went to the garden for the first time and someone's showing you this, these beautiful tomato plants, dozens of plump tomatoes hanging off. And they said, well, where did those come from? How did you grow those? And you hold out in the palm of your hand, a single seed. And they would be like, no, no, <laughs> no, they, can, they, they can't do that. That can't be true. You know, something so big can't come from something so small, but I, I love that Jesus teaches that really great faith, huge changes in life, big comfort, incredible contentment can start with something as small as one sermon that you hear on one Sunday. You know, I bet people who are listening could think of that. Like I might not know the whole Bible. I don't know all 31,000 plus passages, but there's that one passage that, you know, was at my dad's funeral or uh, when I was going through a tough time, I kept running back to it, or it really helped me understand Christianity and God's love. W one little verse, you know, half of a verse, a phrase, those little things can become really big and grow into peace, faith, joy, love, contentment, all these big blessings that people want. So what's really big spiritually starts as small as a single verse from scripture. So that's how faith develops. That's how I get it. I need to get into and read and hear, listen to the word. Ah, uh, almost. All right. So here's almost. the, here's the thing where I hope we get to go is that if you've ever grown a garden before, you don't go out in the spring, throw a bunch of seeds into a plot of dirt and say, nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you, you know, I mean, we know enough about how seeds grow that, that that's an essential step, but man, if you just leave the seeds out there and think you're going to have some great garden, you are 
very mistaken because there are birds and there are bunnies and there are bugs and there are droughts. There's all these threats. So that little seed might not become something big. It might not become anything at all. And that is what Jesus's story, the parable of the sower is all about. Like there's threats to the seed of God's word that you got to know, defend yourself against and persevere so that what's small ends up in something really big. I personally can really relate to the bunnies. <laughs> they are threats. Yes, they are. <laughs> Year-round threats. <laughs> Say, Mike, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the book how writing this book changed you. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one of the cool things and painful things about writing a book is that you have to write it to yourself first. So I would always ask myself, like, what does this chapter have to say to me? And I would say that this book changed me, but not entirely. So even though I know these threats that we're going to talk about here, and some of them still mess with me and get in the way of my faith. But I can say, <laughs> it's a really strong example. So last Christmas, um, I bought some video games for the Nintendo Switch that my daughters occasionally play. And I kind of got one for dad. I got like the new Zelda game. Do you remember Legend of Zelda from back in the day? Uh, that's somewhat familiar. Yeah. So, you know, I start playing this game and it is, it is just perfect for me. I'm loving it. I'm, I'm armoring up with sweet magical swords that I find and I'm fighting and I'm, I'm spending hours every night because this game just has my heart. And I'm right in the middle of this book. And, you know, part of the book is about sometimes we can't put our faith, sometimes our faith doesn't grow big because we have so many other things cluttering it out. And I'm sitting here writing, typing the chapter of this book at work. And then I go home, you know, instead of spending extra time praying or with my family, I'm picking up the controller like, yes, Zelda time. <laughs> and so no joke, um, cold turkey. I was 90% of the way through the game. I was about to get to like the final big boss at the end. And I thought, I got to step away from this. Like video games aren't a bad thing. It, it's, it's a good thing, but it just got so big in my life that it was, it was cluttering the soil, just like a little tomato plant trying to grow around a bunch of weeds. And I just didn't have enough time and energy to love people well. So yeah, the book changed me in a practical way. Made me think about my schedule, my habits, how much I'm trying to pack into a, a given day because my soul really needs space to become uh, something beautiful and good in the eyes of God. So no more Zelda. Oh, it's killing me, Bruce. Still just talking <laughs> about it. I just kind of want to cut this podcast off short and go finish that game. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get let's get uh, going down the road here. Uh, you had already mentioned that this your book is uh, written around one of Jesus' parables. Uh, first of all, what's a parable? And tell us a little bit about this parable and where can we find it in the Bible? Yeah, good question. So a parable is essentially a story that Jesus told so we could understand spiritual things that we can't see. So we can't see the forgiveness of God. So one time he told the story about this kid who took off from home. He really messed things up bad. Then he comes home and the father goes and embraces him and forgives him, right? So you can't see God's compassion and forgiveness. So he tells the story. I think if my math is right, there's about 30 separate stories like that, that Jesus tells in the Bible, but the one actually by word count that gets more, more scriptural press than any others is the one I base this book on. Um, Jesus himself titled it the parable of the sower. So it shows up in uh, Matthew 13. And then again, in Mark chapter four, and then finally in Luke chapter eight. And the super cool thing about this story is that Jesus didn't just tell the story it's one of those two parters or in the second part, he comes back to explain the story. So essentially this whole book, what's big, start small is breaking down verse by verse, phrase by phrase, the number one parable by word count in the entire Bible. And that's all part of part one. In part two, you address six threats to great faith. Why don't you identify those and then talk about a couple of them that you really think are crucial for people today? Yeah. So when I compared Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, you know, trying to realize what happens between the sower sowing the seed and then the seed becoming something big, 30, 60, or 100 times what was sown, 
um, if you kind of look at the wording Jesus used, I counted six separate things that could happen between sowing and harvest. And I kind of gave them my own names. So the six threats, as I list them in the book, are pride, pain, worries, wealth, wants, and not waiting. Pride, pain, worries, wealth, wants, and not waiting. So sometimes our faith doesn't grow because of pride, sometimes pain, sometimes worry, sometimes wealth, sometimes uh, wants, and sometimes just not waiting. And so each of those things gets a chapter in this book. So which ones do you think are, are is there a priority to them? Which ones do you think, or is it just an individual thing? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, having, you know, some of my friends have read this book already and they've definitely said, well, you know, I'm a pretty committed Christian. So this part definitely spoke to me. And this part was, uh, it felt like it was for someone else. So I think Jesus is just a master storyteller and he's hitting all different kinds of people. So I'm hoping that this book, you know, just part of it, uh, my friend who gave me this feedback said, this isn't the book that I wanted to read. This was kind of the book that I needed to read. (laughs) You know, that one chapter was like his Zelda moment where he realized, oh yeah, that's what's happening. So uh, I should probably take a little bit of time and kind of break down those six things, huh? Yes, let's yeah. do that. So real quickly, uh, pride. Um, you have kids, right, Bruce? Uh, yes, adult yeah. kids. Yeah, when you were raising your kids and they were teenagers, were there any conversations that you had as a dad where they were like physically in the room he- hearing your words, but you kind of got the impression they weren't taking your words to heart? They listen to this podcast, so I got to watch what I say. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had many conversations. Sometimes, you know, maybe it wasn't taken to heart, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I think so, that's everybody. Yeah, in, indeed. I think that's right too. So, you know, sometimes you hear something, but maybe your pride gets in the way. So you don't, you're not really listening to it. You're not taking it to heart. And Jesus said that can happen with God's word. So I could hear a sermon about loving my neighbor or forgiving my enemy or being selfless with my wife. But, you know, part of me is like, ah, I, don't, I, don't, I know that's going to mess with me. So I'll, I'll hear it and I'll get through the church service. But am I really taking it to heart? Um, Jesus said that's like a, sowing a seed on a really hard path. And a bird comes, snatches it up, gobbles it down. No harvest, no fruit, nothing happens. You hear it, but it doesn't change you. It doesn't produce anything in you. That's number one, pride. Number two is pain. Um, Jesus said some of the seed fell in what he calls rocky soil and it springs up really quickly, but then the hot sun comes out. And because this little sprout doesn't have a lot of roots, it quickly starts to wither. Oh, what does that mean? Jesus explains. Sometimes people hear the word and they love it. Oh, the Bible's great. God loves me. His word is truth. He teaches me, shepherds me, guides me. But sometimes when your friends hear about these things, It's like a blazing hot sun that makes it very difficult for your new faith. So I might love that the Bible's true, but man, sometimes the Bible judges people and their behavior. My friends don't like that. Sometimes I find out Jesus is the way to heaven. Like he gets me good to God. But well, what is that saying to my family members who don't believe in Jesus? Am I judgmental or bigoted? So there's a whole bunch of teachings in the Bible that you might love personally, but your closest friends and family don't. And that can be really difficult, especially for new Christians. And that initial joy that they had, it starts to wither and wane and it never produces fruit. Now, the next section Jesus talks about, I think is going to be really applicable for a lot of the people who are listening today. Um, He actually puts three separate threats in this one category. He says some seed, um, it falls among this thorny soil. So here these weeds grow up. Apparently the soil is good. Like there's enough moisture and sun that lots of things are growing, but because there's so many things growing next to each other, there's not enough nutrients for the good seed to produce really good fruit. And Jesus says, because of it, it's not fruitful. It doesn't mature. It's not like it dies and withers or gets snatched up like the birds. It just never becomes what the sower wanted it to be. Oh, what does that mean? Jesus's explanation is this. Sometimes you're so worried about things and sometimes you're so busy with wanting other things, or sometimes you're so busy working to make money that you might hear, you you might go to church, 
but your life is so busy and so cluttered and so rushed that do you actually have time to think about what you heard at church or put it into practice? That's the part of the book. <laughs> that was my Zelda moment, right? Um, it's not that I'm giving up Jesus. It's just that I don't have a lot of time to love the people in my home because I'm busy with other things. And so I break down in this part of the book, like this part of the book is probably going to punch every reader right in the face in a beautiful biblical way. You know, I talk about sports. I talk about binging shows. I talk about news. I talk about our phones. I talk about screens. I talk about raising kids and playing club sports. I talk about work and how many hours you put in. And should you take this promotion? I talk about being people pleasers. Um, I, I kind of break all of that down in a super practical level, just getting back to this basic question. Does your soul have enough space for God's word to truly grow to what he wants it to be? Yeah, this section uh, with the worry and the wealth and the, the wanting, uh, that's very practical. And it's looking yourself in the in the mirror reading those pages. Yeah. Yeah. Can I share a quick story with you? Sure. So I, I mentioned in the book about the best advice I've gotten in my whole life. And it actually connected to a bit of research I did uh, on the other pastors of the church where I serve. So um, I'm doing a sermon about self-care in a couple of weeks here at our church, you know, taking care of yourself, working out, sleeping, balancing, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And I asked the four other pastors I serve with some really specific questions. I asked them, how many hours do you work in an average week? Uh, how many hours do you sleep in an average night? How many times do you work out? Do you take any days off? And have you ever almost quit being a pastor? So they start replying to my email. And I'm not kidding you, Bruce. All four of them had the exact same story. I'm working 60, 70, 70 plus hours a week. I'm barely sleeping. I would love to work out. I don't got time for that. A day off sounds great. A weekend, I ain't got time for that. And all of them almost quit. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, they said, some of them said my family staged an intervention. I had to have some loving other pastors come and smack me upside the face and say, you're not fruitful. Like you are so worried to pick Jesus's word. You're so worried about disappointing the members of your church. Or you want to do so many things to be great at preaching and great at teaching and great at visiting people and great at catechism and great at all of this. You're so cluttered. And all these guys would admit, I was stressed. I was impatient. I would complain about my church. I was exhausted. I was bitter. Like they were not fruitful like Jesus wanted them to be. Not because they were doing bad things, but because their schedules and their souls were so cluttered up with good things. There's only one pastor out of the five of us who never got to the point of almost quitting. And that pastor was me. And the reason was because of something my home pastor said to me right before I started my career. In the book, I tell the long story. Here's the short version. He said, Mike, when you get to your first church, I want you to ask your leaders how many hours you should work. And I said to him, that is the worst advice. Anyone has ever given. Like that's that is so profoundly bad. Like I'm gonna roll in. This is brand new, you know. Hey, I'm here to serve you. And how many hours exactly do I have to work? So, you know, I pushed back and he said, No, Mike, listen. He's like, You you could do all the things. You could you could work day and night, and there's still gonna be stuff that you miss. And you're gonna be so worried about like disappointing people that you're gonna burn out and you're not gonna be good for them, and it's not gonna be good for you. So I took his advice. I swallowed hard. I went to my church, first church leadership meeting. I said, Hey, I don't want to do this, but my, my pastor said I had to ask you. Um, and here's how I, I framed it. I said to the people around the table, I don't want to have to quit. I don't want to be a really great pastor who breaks your heart in three years. Cause I can't do it. I don't want to fake like I have a good marriage and just smile and hold Kim's hand on Sunday when we're fighting at home. I don't want my kids to hate the church or Jesus because it's taken their father away from them. Like, I want to serve you with, with joy and, and do this for the long haul. So what do you all think? 
How many hours could you work and still be close to Jesus, close to your spouse, close to your kids? And what happened in, in that conference room on that night honestly has changed my life. Um, one guy said, I could work 45 hours. Another guy said, I think I could do 50. Another said 40. Another said 55. We took the average of all their answers. And ever since then, for the past 18 years, I've been tracking about how many hours I work. And, you know, some seasons are busy and you push the number. But I, I've tried like not to be so worried about what people think of how much I produce. And that has allowed me, obviously far from perfect, but it has just allowed me to enjoy my work, to have time for my wife and kids, to sleep eight hours a night, to take care of my body so my brain is fresh, so I actually like what I'm doing. Um, so before I even understood the parable, the sower wrote this book, I had kind of experienced its blessings. And my, my really wise pastor who pushed me to an uncomfortable place, he just helped me find a kind of joy and balance and fruitfulness that I never would have had otherwise. So I'm hoping this book can kind of pass on some of that wisdom to the people who read it. I was just going to make a confession that uh, earlier in my ministry, when I was serving as a pastor of a congregation, I was in that place. I'm not perfect uh, today, but in a much better place in terms of uh, setting aside, pushing aside those threats uh, to, to, to faith and relationships. Yeah. Yeah. And I know it's not just a pastor thing, right? There's, there's people who are new to their career and it's just like, you, you want to return emails fast to impress the boss or you're a new parent and you just want all these good things for your kids. So you, you know, you want them in sports because they're going to connect and make friends. And you know that if they're involved in this doors might open for them in the future. And, you know, so often it's not with bad intentions. Um, have you ever noticed on the back of a seed packet, it actually doesn't just say, you know, here's how long it will take to grow this seed. It actually tells you how far apart to space the seeds. Like, I never knew that, but it makes sense, right? There's only so much soil if you want the seed to grow. And so I think when it comes to our own souls, when it comes to our families, we just have to be realistic that pouring a thousand things into our lives does not produce what we want in the end and less is more and picking and choosing according to Jesus leads to 30 or 60 or 100 times what was sown. Anything else you want to mention about uh, this threat uh, regarding the thorns or should we move on to the last one? Um, yeah, may maybe one quick thing. Um, I'm just asking people, there's actually an exercise in the book to take a time audit. So what I kind of realized, you know, my, my Zelda example, video games might seem dumb, but I don't think I realized like how many hours I was putting into it until I actually stopped and counted the hours. And you might not realize how much you're watching Milwaukee Brewers baseball or Packers football until you actually stop and say, okay, how many hours am I doing on my phone watching Netflix? <laughs> I mean, the good thing about all this data tracking is that we actually can get those numbers pretty easily. So I'm just asking people to be honest. And I have a hunch that God will open your eyes to say, oh man, like, no wonder I don't know my neighbor's name. I'm like inside <laughs> staring at a screen, watching people chase each other around on a football field for dozens of hours every fall. And I don't even know who that person is. So it just gives some perspective. And I sense that God will guide you into what needs to be corrected or rebalanced so that you can become the fruitful Christian that he wants you to be. I'd like you to spend just a few minutes on the sixth threat to great faith, not waiting, because this mm. one really uh, hit home for me. Yeah. Because I'm impatient. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once again, a seed, no gardener throws a seed, stares at it, looks up at the heavens and says, it's not working. <laughs> they, and they don't come back tomorrow and think that, and they don't come back in a week and think that and they don't, they don't come back in a month and think that we know enough about seeds. They're like, okay, this is, this is going to take a whole season. It's going to take months to produce what I want it to, but it's worth it. You know, protecting this, pulling the weeds, putting up the fence to keep the bunnies out. Like eventually what it produces is good, but like a farmer, you have to be willing to wait for it. And I think for a lot of people, 
don't know, maybe you can tell me, is this worse today than it used to be? You know, we're just used to 5G, Wi-Fi, fast food, streaming videos. We don't wait till next week for the next episode. You know, Netflix just automatically plays it for us. And so these things of God, of like producing peace and joy and a connection to Jesus in us, it, it just takes time. We're, we're growing up like, like kids in our faith after being born again. And so we just, sometimes we're doing the right things. We got a good balance. We're loving God. We're making space for him. We're not too worried about what friends and family think. And sometimes we do the right thing and we just have to say, okay, I'm in a good spot. God, you're the one that makes faith grow. So I'm going to wait for you to bless me. I'm going to be patient with this process and believe that your word is not going to come back empty. Say, Pastor Mike, at the end of the book, you tell a story about another Mike who came into your office one day. As we wrap up here, can you share that story? Oh, man. Bruce, God is, would you say amen that God is good at his job? Amen. <laughs> yeah, this was so crazy to me. So um, I think it was in two Novembers ago, I was preaching a sermon series at our church about gratitude and grumbling. And in one of the sermons I had said, Hey, if you really struggle with you know, grumbling and complaining and venting and something's always wrong with work and school and everything else, before you go to bed, this was my suggestion, go through the alphabet from A to Z and see if you can list one blessing that God gave you for each letter. So the air that I breathe, the Bible next to my bed, my cat or my dog that jumps into my lap, the things that I got to eat today, you know, so 26 total blessings. My thought was maybe that'll push some of that negativity and grumbling out of your heart. Well, right after that sermon, there's this guy named Mike from our church, older gentleman, faithful, fruitful Christian. And he says to me, pastor Mike, 26 blessings, question mark, exclamation point. I bet I could do 2,600 blessings. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> so yeah. I replied to that right away. I'm like, I dare you. And then he replied right away. And he said, oh, well, when do I have to have them done by? And I gave him a, a couple months. I said, how about by Easter? You have the list done. And oh my goodness, what happened next was so beautiful. So um, here's Mike. He opens up a document and he starts with the A's and he starts typing not only a blessing, but a short description of why it had really been a good thing in his life. And he starts listing his favorite Christian songs and hymns, the pastors and teachers that have blessed his soul over the years, um, his wife who was in heaven and some of her favorite things, his favorite foods, um, infrastructure. He started to realize like, wow, what would life be like without roads or highways or engines or electricity or telephone poles or sidewalks? He actually got himself a handheld audio recorder. So he'd be, I don't know if this is safe or not, but he'd be driving down the street, just like grabbing his audio recorder, remembering all these things that God had put into his life. And no joke, I think it took him uh, 50 some days. And he walks into my office and he hands me a binder. And the cover of the binder says 26, crossed out, 2,600 blessings. And tiny print, dozens and dozens and dozens of pages, the most beautiful, inspirational thing. And he shows me this thing. He said it changed his life. Like he is so grateful. He sees God's hand every which way that God is so good to him in so many ways. And Mike leaves and he wraps up the conversation. And it dawns on me. That morning before Mike walked into my office, I was working on the manuscript for this book. How what's really, really big starts small. And how a little seed, Jesus said, can grow into a hundred times more than what was sown. And I thought about that one sermon. Give me 26 blessings, I said. And what did he hand me? 2,600. 2,600. A hundred, exactly 100 times what I had sown. So how, how, did, how did Mike become like the most grateful, inspiring Christian I've ever met? One message, God sowed one seed in his direction and he pushed it and he protected it and he prioritized it. And it brought back just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in all my years of ministry. So that, that's what this book is about. You don't have to be a Bible 
scholar or expert, like next Sunday, God's throwing something at you and he wants it to become something really big. He's going to help you guard it and protect it so that you too can have great faith. So I have a question. This this book is coming out in June. How can people get it? Ooh, that's probably important for us to talk about, huh? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Here's this book that could really bless you, but I don't know where to find it. Yeah, so easiest place to go is just Amazon. I think you can find it on Barnes & Noble as well. So just look up What's Big Start Small by Mike Novotny on Amazon. You can pre-order your copy if you're hearing this before June 14th. Otherwise, it drops June 14th, and I hope everyone can pick it up. Well, we have been with Pastor Mike Novotny today on Bible Threads. It's uh, just an inspiration to hear about the book that is being published. I think people are really going to benefit from it and be blessed by it. So this is uh, Dr. Bruce Becker with uh, Bible Threads. Uh, thanks for listening and God bless.